understanding is that uh, chairman has, should be quite rigid here. So uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Henry. Thank you very much. And we'll we'll maybe come back to we will we'll come back to this in the in, in the in this discussion after that. And uh, now um, I'm wondering whether Luigi Tizano is there. Yeah, I see you. Um, are you ready to to share your screen and uh, uh, give your talk? Yeah, please go ahead to. Can you see now? Yes. Can you see that? Uh, perfect, yeah. So now we have Luigi Tetano um, from the Simon Center for Geometry and Physics with Tony Brook, and he will give a, a um, talk on delayed confinement and the Hawking page transition again, uh, 25 minutes plus, uh, plus five minutes question. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, today, I want to tell you about a work I, I did in collaboration very recently with Christian Copetti, Alba Grassi, and Zohar Komargotsky. And our main goal was to revisit some questions about uh, large N deconfinement transition and its application to gravity and to black hole physics. Uh, so, uh, just let me remind you very quickly about it. So in large and young Mills theory, a criterion for confinement is whether the free energy scale at large and as order one, uh, in that case, receiving contribution from color singlets, or scale, or if it's, it's not confining, it would be deconfining, scaling as order and squared, reflecting gluon contribution. So uh, in the context of ADS-CFT correspondence, it was actually discovered a long time ago by Witten that uh, the deconfinement transition has a beautiful interpretation in terms of uh, black hole formations in ADS. And here, the study of thermodynamics of ADS black hole that was pioneered by Hawking and Page becomes uh, very important. So today, uh, my goal would be to revisit uh, some of this idea in the context of N equal four. And more precisely, I would like to study uh, whether a special observable that you can define in N equal four, which is the superconformal index, can actually deconfine and account for a knocking page transition. So let me remind you some uh, basic facts about the large N deconfinement transition in N equal four. And uh, there a central tool that you develop is the study of the following unitary matrix model. This is an infinite sum over a double trace uh, unitary matrix model. And it has uh, a number of couplings a n that are known exactly, and they are uh, oh, they are real. And the phase transition of this model is usually described in the following way. So, if a n minus one is less than zero, uh, the most dominant contribution that will be uh, uh, here for the model will be the one with trace u equal to zero, and that's because all the coefficient in the exponential here will be negative. So in this case, we would say that the eigenvalues are spread uh, on the unit circle, and we will refer to this as a confined phase with order one scaling. Now, if some of the a n minus one are greater than zero, uh, instead the eigenvalue will be supported only on a subset of the unit circle. And that becomes very clear that the center of symmetry is broken, and that's what we expect from the deconfined phase. So the point is that there is a special point in this analysis where the sign of this a n minus one flip from negative to positive. And in this context, we, we, we are instructed that in the large n saddle point analysis, we should always discard the confined saddle and go to the deconfined one. So this is what I'm gonna define as a weekly first order phase transition because these two phases really never coexist. They never have an overlapping region of validity, and we have to switch between one another at this special point. Now, my goal today is to convince you that when you switch to complex coupling AN, so if you promote AN to be co generic complex coupling, we need to revise this logic. And in particular, we'll see that there are two new features that emerges. One is that uh, at large N, the saddle point analysis uh, receives some cancellation due to this complex coupling. And this cancellation leads to the phenomenon that we call delayed, delayed deconfinement, meaning that even though the real part of a, a the, sorry, even though a real part of a n minus one changes sign, we do not expect a phase transition to take place there. 
And most importantly, in this context with complex coupling, we expect the phase transition to be completely first order, meaning that we really expect phase coexistence here. So in order to highlight all these features, I'm gonna study a simple model, which is a model with a single complex coupling. So if you go back to the previous slide, I'm just fixing now to an analysis with only one coupling. And now I take that coupling to be complex and I parameterize it in this way with a phase phi. And another uh, useful trick that uh, I'm gonna do is to introduce um, another field that I call the nabbard stratonovich field. And its effect is to basically decouple this double trace interaction. So the analysis of the original matrix model is now traded in this double integral over here. And basically the idea is that we will first analyze the unitary matrix model here and then perform the subtle point approximation over G. Uh, let me remind you that now G and is also complex. So we are integrating on a contour in complex G plane with an angle that's defined by the phase of A1 that we introduced. And for convergence reason, reasons, we take the real part of A1 to be positive. Now, this integral is not completely uh, unknown because you see on the right-hand side, we have this integral, which is a famous uh, unitary matrix model and that single trace. And it's been known for, it was introduced a long time ago by Gross, Witten, and Wadia. And it's uh, for real G, uh, we know everything about this model. In particular, we know we, we, can, we can solve it at large n and we can find this large genus, sorry, the genus zero free energy of this model, which is given by this function here. And here I will refer to ungapped as basically as before the phase that has uh, eigenvalue distributed on the unit circle. And gap for me will be the phase where the eigenvalue distribution developed a gap on the unit circle. So the, the problem now is that we want to analyze the gross width and vadia for complex coupling G. And there a complete picture is not yet available. And the reason for this is that when you, when you promote G to be a complex coupling, we have to study a matrix model that potentially might have multi-cuts exactly as uh, um, Harry just introduced in his talk. So very schematically, when we wanna solve a large and multi cuts matrix model, we should sum over all the arrangements of eigenvalues and uh, in where basically this N1 to NS uh, represent the number of eigenvalue in each cuts and we have S cuts here. So in principle for a given complex G, there will be a dominant saddle, but then there will also be many subdominant sub large N saddles. And the analysis there would be that we also expect that there are some, this, that this subdominant large N saddle will be connected to the dominant one, potentially by tunneling. And this tunneling is, is mediated by a function A of G, which is what we call the matrix model instant on action, which can, in certain cases, can be computed exactly. So our approach here was very practical. So what we wanted to do was to take the, the two phases that we know very well at real G, the both one cut phases, and try to analytically continue them and then study the large N analysis with some, with some degree of confidence in these two regions. For example, in the gapped one cut phase, we already know from an analysis of Marinho that you can compute the instant on action. And so you can basically, uh, one of our point is that there is a region in the complex G plane where we expect that the gap one cut phase will be, it will be possible to analytically continue such gap one cut phase. And in order to determine such region, we basically look at the criterion for which instant on tunneling has to be suppressed. And uh, this, is also, this was studied also a long time ago in the matrix model literature. And the criterion is basically that the real part of the instant on action has to be positive. And similarly, we can do the same analysis also in the real, in the uh, weak up in the, sorry, in the ungapped phase. And we can draw the following diagram. So here we have two regions where we control the model very well. These are the blue and the orange region. And so these are the analytic continuation of both the gapped and ungapped one cut phase. 
And then, of course, there will also be regions where multi-cut phases might potentially dominate the gross wit and value at complex G. But it turns out that for the, for the application that we're interested in, luckily, this region will not be of relevance. So once you study the gross width and Wadia model, you still have one integral to do, and that's the integral over the G plane. And in general, we know that at large n, that is a complex integral that will have a sum over various saddles that I wrote down here, and I call the saddle G star. And this will be an exponential contribution, give an exponential contribution of n squared times a function Q which is defined like this, where F0 is the gross width and Wadia free energy that I already defined. So clearly this, uh, in this sum as a saddle at G star equal to zero. And at G star equal to zero, uh, this potential will be dominated by the ungapped phase of the gross width and Wadia. And for this reason, we do not expect that this uh, integral will, will give any exponential contribution around G equal to zero. But there is also another interesting saddle point, uh, which is that G star equal A1 plus square root A1 times A1 minus one. And this saddle is interesting because it's self-consistent with respect of the condition that we just uh, required. So we can basically stay in the gapped one cut phase and also prevent instant on tunneling because if we evaluate the instant on action on this saddle, we are guaranteed that this will be positive. So this means that if we evaluate this function Q over the saddle G star, we know with a high degree of confidence that there is a region in uh, where this, the real part of this function Q is positive. And for such region, reason, the matrix model integral will have an exponentially growing behavior, which means that it's in a deconfined phase. But this also highlight a very interesting phenomenon, which is we can, study the dependence on the complex A1 of this function Q and draw a curve in this complex space that we call the deconfinement curve. And it's this red curve here. And this has two important ap application. Basically, we can see right away from this picture that for real A1, the integral over G will be now over a real line and the deconfinement curve, it's equivalent to requiring that A1 is equal to one. However, you can notice that if you have complex A1, the transition, the, the large end deconfinement transition happens way beyond the point where the sign of real part of A1 changes sign. So we could perfectly have phases where the real part of A1 is greater than one, but we are in this blue region where we do not expect deconfinement of the full model. So deconfinement is expected to take place only across this region here. And the second point is that if we are in the blue region, it is perfectly uh, possible that both the ungapped and gapped phase of the full model coexist. In fact, you can see that pretty clearly. But uh, on, in the blue region, the ungapped phase dominates. And so we expect no exponential behavior. And once we jump over this wall, we see that there is uh, exponential behavior due to the gap saddle. So across this line, there is a change of dominance. And this is exactly the behavior that we expect with purely first order transition. While if you go to real A1, this region completely pinches to a point. And so we, we really never can talk about the coexistence of the two phases. And that's why in the real case, we would discuss this as a weekly first order transition. Now, I told you that I'm interested in the super conformal index. So I'll now pass to describe you what that is. The super conformal index is a natural observable that you can define in n equal uh, one, more generally in n equal one super conformal field theory. It's the partition function of the SCFT on S3 times S1. And for this reason, it counts supersymmetric states on S3 times R. And by the state operator correspondence, we know that this will correspond to B the counting of BPS local operator in flat space. This is a very robust uh, object to study because it's as many indices is uh, independent of deformation. And in, in this particular case, it was proven that uh, the index is completely independent of marginal deformation. 
So you can pick a supercharge inside n equal to one that has the following commutation relation. And we define the BPS condition as this thing being equal to zero. So the index will be the trace over the Hilbert space of BPS states, with, which counts with sign the following states. And for n equal to four, so if we see n equal to four as an n equal one theory with, as a special example of n equal one theory, this will correspond to the count of 116 local BPS operator. Now, the important point for us is that the superconformal index belongs to a class of unitary matrix model, exactly the same one that I already introduced for you. And the coefficients there are known explicitly. They are basically expressed in terms of the fugacity P and Q. And it is well known that if you take P and Q to be real and all both less than one, all this A n minus one will be negative. And so at large n, exactly as I told you at the introduction, we would expect that the most dominant contribution of the exponential is the one where trace u is equal to zero. And so we expect that the index is in a, in a confined phase. So this is like slightly disappointing for our interest because as I told you, we would like to know if the index stay confines. And also, we also know that in, in, in the application to gravity, there are a large BPS black hole in ADS5 whose entropy grows like order n squared. So if we were to match the deconfinement transition with those black hole, we would need to find a different behavior for the index. So let me just remind you very quickly about BPS black hole in ADS5. These were these are 1 16th BPS black holes. They were found long time ago in ADS5 by Gutowski and Royal. They are characterized by three electric charges, which belong to the maximal torus inside the SO6R symmetry in n equal to four. They have two extra angular momentum, J1 and J2. And these we will focus on extremal black holes. So this means that the charges and the angular momentum have a nonlinear relation that they need to be satisfied in such a way that only four parameter will be really completely independent. So for what I'd be concerned, actually I will even further simplify to a case of a, of a single black hole with all the charges being equal to each other and all the angular momentum being equal to each other. And it's known that the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy of this black hole is given by the following expression. One way to recover the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy uh, was discovered quite recently in terms of, uh, and it's uh, given in terms of uh, basically a legend transformation of the black hole free energy. This was a nice idea that was put forward by Sen already in the context of asymptotically flat black hole and then adapted to the case of ADS by these authors. And there's a nice review by Zaffaroni about this topic. And so here you basically do a legend transformation of this free energy, which is defined as follow. And this uh, quantity omega and also a quantity delta that is introduced here are both two general complex chemical potential, which because of supersymmetry are uh, subject to the following constraints. So three delta is equal to two omega minus two pi i. So I wanna emphasize that in this uh, extremization procedure, we take a complex uh, general chemical potential, but this still leads to a well-defined uh, entropy, which is real. So, in, in particular, because we work with, with this complex uh, chemical potential, we can also uh, quite easily define uh, what we would call a Hawking page line in the space of complex fugacity omega, which is a line where we expect that the free energy of thermal gravitons will switch its dominance to, towards uh, the free energy of ADS black hole. And this line in complex fugacity space is basically defined by the real part of this free energy being equal to zero. So it, of course, an uh, interesting question for our model is whether or not we can match with the, or in some way match this line in the complex fugacity space with our analysis of the index. So many recent developments in this business of the, of the superconformal index have all revolved around the idea that in order to capture potential deconfining behavior, 
we need to allow for a generic complex fugacity also at the level of the index. And that's precisely what we did in our work. So we use the general parametrization where we take P equal to Q equal to uh, Y times E to the I Psi. And then we studied the superconformal index as uh, in its global properties as a function of Y and Psi. So there are many interesting features that emerges. There's also a nice connection to the Cardist uh, limit. But for what we are concerned today, I can tell you that we found deconfining phases in the index. And one, the way that we could analyze them is because when you promote the P and Q to complex variable, all the couplings in the matrix model that I described you become complex. And so we are ready to use all the tools that or we are already introduced. For example, we can start to compute the deconfinement curve from the model uh, with a single complex coupling. So you take this single complex coupling and then you study that function Q of A1 and G star exactly for this model. However, there's an important caveat that we need to take into account is that as I told you, when you work with complex coupling, the transition is actually a first order one. So there's no real sense in which we can ignore a correction to this deconfinement curve due to the couplings with n greater than one. But uh, this is not a disaster because uh, basically when you study the value of this coupling near this uh, transition region that we are interested in, you'll find that the effects of all this coupling is actually numerically small. So uh, even though we don't have uh, parametrically uh, suppression of the IR coupling, we can still do many computation. We can still do systematic truncation. And in particular, if you just study the model with both A1 and A2 couplings, you find a remarkable agreement with the prediction of gravity. So I can, I can show you here in this picture, the blue line will be the deconfinement curve that I obtained by studying the unitary matrix model with just one complex coupling. And already, if I include the effects of A1 plus A2, we see that this curve will go much closer to the deconfinement line that, uh, that you would find from gravity. So this is actually nice because, uh, because of this phenomena, we don't see any actual discrepancy between the prediction of gravity and the prediction of field theory. And so there is no reason to think about new and familiar degrees of freedom that should explain the discrepancy. Just you need to take into account the effects of this IRN and be careful about the effects of complex coupling. And so with this, I'm going to conclude here and I wanna thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, yeah, that was actually a, even a bit faster than time yet, I think. But uh, so um, who would like to ask the first question? Yes. Yeah. yeah please go ahead. So I already asked this, uh, Luis, I guess. But, yeah. uh, I was wondering like, if there is an analog of small black hole. Yeah, so I, I went investigating. So yeah, if you study, so, so yeah, it, okay. If you study this condition that I told you where the real part of F, you said that, so then you would see that uh, there is a branch that that's kind of has branches. Mm -hmm. So there will be a branch of parameter where you find things that looks like uh, small black holes, but uh, the, in that region, so so I, what, the the only thing I can say is that because you know with the index you work with the grand canonical ensembles, so they are they will never dominate. So you would probably have to work with a different parameterization, and also in that region of parameter, it's not obvious that the the matrix model analysis. You know you have to really repeat the entire analysis for a different uh, region of parameters. So yeah. Okay. It might be interesting to look into that. Okay. Further questions? I guess there are several people raising hands, I think. Uh, yeah. So uh, let me see. There's no way to see the order here. So um, if you think you were, well, so. I think Edgar, Edgar was first, I think. How about Edgar? Yeah. How about Edgar? Uh, 
Thanks. And just a quick question. So you compared to the deconfinement curve. What if you just compare it to the the left edge of your blue curve when the saddle just even begins existing in gravity? Is there a match between when your saddles exist and when that solution um, uh, exists in the gravitational picture? Uh, uh, you mean? Uh... I'm. I'm yeah, imagining yeah. a picture like the BTZ threshold. You know, there's a transition at beta equals two pi where the BTZ black hole starts dominating, but the black hole starts existing before that, um, but it doesn't exist no, all the way down. No, to sorry, zero. sorry. I just want to say that. So for the so the red curve, so you might do you remember? So the red curve is where also black holes start existing, like physically sensible black holes. Uh, so there's there's no gravitational saddle before that line. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, thank you. So I can share again the screen. Uh, that so 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 this red curve is where where I, like physical black hole will start existing. And uh, the problem in this analysis for the field theory side would have been if you were to say that deconfinement start over the blue curve, because I mean it's not a problem, but it would mean that somehow deconfinement in field theory triggers before known black holes. So in your earlier plot, the coexistence phase, you're saying that the black hole did not exist during the coexistence no, no, the, phase? In my, in, my, in my first slide, this yeah, is- Yeah, I was asking about that curve. Yeah, sorry. In this phase, the, here I'm just looking at the mod, so where, where you have deconfinement versus where you don't have it. So it's not right, yet- Right, so I thought in the blue region, you ha so, don't you so, have the- black hole solution and your saddles? No, 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 in this, in this blue region, there's no black hole. This is because you see it would be behind the red. So the red curve there is translated, if you want, to the blue curve here. So there will be some part, the blue region there will be some region in this area. I don't know if you... I, I thought in the blue region, both saddles exist, but the black both hole does not dominate. In, and field then, theory, in field theory, yes. Yeah. But that doesn't map into both saddles existing in the gravitational. I mean, in gravity, in gravity, you will have a not. No, you don't have a. So okay, in gravity, you'll have a thermal graviton saddle, just not a black hole saddle. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. So then the next one was again Leopoldo, I think. Right. So thanks, uh, Luigi, for the nice talk. Um, so my question is a little bit uh, about. So what in your analysis is really very dependent on four dimensions, because as you know, right, the answer comes from some, some anomaly ultimately. In three dimensions, uh, this is not going to happen. Nevertheless, your, your, your analysis seems to be completely generic. So what, what's, have you thought about other dimensions or do you, I mean, what was your point of view uh, on that? I mean, in, okay, so in different dimensions, uh, the, if you want these indices, these BPS indices are governed by maybe, well, not maybe they are governed by different kind of matrix models. So like just, you know, if you want to do some kind of analysis like this, you would have to adapt it to different kinds yes. of matrix okay. models. So, I but mean, I just, yeah, I was a little confused because you're you're using gross with gross width and wadia, which is very universal. So I would expect that this, this would be yeah. kind of dimension independent, but on the other hand, we know it will be it will crucially depend on dimensions. Uh, I think that one one direction that we are kind of more than the dimensionality, one direction that we are excited is that this kind of unitary matrix model with the double trace appears also in studies of non-supersymmetric theories, just even pure QCD and stuff like that. And so so it would be very interesting to study, you know, there's a, so, so it would be interesting to study again, this problem of large and deconfinement also in those cases when the couplings become complex. Mm -hmm. And uh, it might be interesting also for so, some, yeah. Thanks, so if I may, one, one other little thing, which is a little technical. So why, why do you need uh, the hobart stradonovich uh, trick? Uh, because I, I'm wondering whether you have some physical feeling in mind or something that will become dynamical later? No, it's more like uh, that. So, so the way we got into that is that at first we were 
um, well, it, it's just a very, it, it's, it's very good to use it because, be, because since we can basically linearize this double trace interaction, we can study the problem in two steps and it's uh, much less uh, technical in, technically involved. And uh, at the beginning also, there was some kind of, we had some kind of idea that the model could be actually truncated for just one coupling. So that would have been uh, just a natural thing to do. But uh, it turns out that you have to also include the higher, the higher uh, corrections. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So let's see. Um... I don't see any more raised hands for... Can I ask a question? Oh, yeah, sure. Let's go uh, ahead. Okay, N nice talk, Luigi. Uh, so just off curiosity, so for complex uh, fugacities, mm -hmm. does this black hole solutions ex actually exist? I mean, the part of your red yeah, curve. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a nice question. So in general, so what you have to do, it's... Uh, so so I, I didn't show you, let me... Uh, can I share again my screen? So for just a second. Okay, so in this in this red curve here, yes, so there is a special point indeed, which is this red point here, where mm -hmm. along this curve all the all the charges are real. So this is like a natural physical black hole. Yes. Like, so all these red points are completely healthy solution of the Euclidean uh, path integral. They are super symmetric, but uh, their their charges are not real. So, uh, so, so this what, what, yeah. The question is, what is the uh, explanation of this from the gravity side? I so think, there are some. So the way I think about it, but uh, but uh, maybe there are other way to think about it. Is that. Uh, when you so, so basically you know these are a solution of some bps equation in gravity and this mm -hmm. is the, you are doing this in the in a euclidean background so in mm -hmm. particular these uh, um, reality condition in euclidean background are very subtle even in field theory mm -hmm. and actually it's very common that we turn on complex uh, background fields and so mm -hmm. you, could, you you can imagine that in this uh, euclidean path integral there's uh, plenty of supersymmetric configuration which with the reality condition are a bit funny and in fact well this, I, yeah i can accept some complex background gauge fields but are you saying that the metric will be complex as well it seems to have no. to be complex because you are changing the you are changing i mean the p and q essentially are a complex structure of the boundary right so that changes the boundary metric to be no, complex. No, you, no, no, because you in the in terms of the p and q of the, on s three times s one, when you do this kind of shift, mm -hmm. you basically are, are modifying the way the circle is fiber over s three. Right. So, so, so it's going to be a complex ADS five metric, but you say if I reduce this to some four dimensional space, I'm just saying, yeah, it's just a supersymmetric solution. So. Right. And it's regular, so it's like uh, in principle, you know, by the gravity point of view. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, uh, what does it mean physically, uh, the, the complex, uh, uh, these complex couplings? Uh, and, or it's completely unphysical? No, no, no. You mean? No, for for comp so physically so physically this means that if you think about the index as being uh, the partition function on s three times s one, uh, there is no reason why you don't want to explore that observable for a more generical background, and so that means that if you shift the fugacity in the way I'm talking about, we will have different vibration of the circle over s three. So. Basically, and that also, it's very interesting because when we take the, the circle vibration to be very small, we can study something like the high temperature limit and so on. But this delayed for the confinement phase is sort of a physical feature of the model or what? Yeah, yeah, it's just that, it's just that if you were to study this, this problem by the standard, well, I don't wanna call them standards, 
But by the old method, you would just take the observable, do the large n expansion, and say that this scales like order one. But there was nowhere in this uh, description uh, where you had to put the fugacity real. And so there's no reason why you would go to the, you would make the claim that there's no deconfinement. In fact, as a matter of fact, if you take for granted ADS CFT, there's no reason why the index shouldn't decompile. Mm -hmm. But sorry, but I guess the question is that uh, is this complex fugacity a trick or is there something physically deep? So I understand it's a trick to lift the kind of massive degeneracies in the super comparable index. Um, so if you can, if you're powerful enough to actually compute the planning function, you should see the deconfinement confinement transition without any problem. So is the complex fugacity a trick to avoid I, the translations at, mm, I, or is it physically, physically deep? Okay, I don't want to, I, I'm not sure about your definition of physically deep, but uh, um, I, I just think that uh, there's like, a, there's a, so, I mean, there are reasons to suspect that when you do that, uh, there is a different, for example, already if you analyze things like the high temperature limit of this system, there's mm -hmm. a different growth in states compared to the real fugacity case. And uh, for this reason, I would expect that there are more interesting physical reasons why this happens. So I, right. I don't think it's just an accident of... But, but sorry, Luigi. Can it be that like if you try to go to microcanonical ensemble by doing the Janda transformation, that integral is dominated by some complex chemical potential, and that's why you need to look at those values. Um, I have I don't know right now. I don't know. Because I saw Leopoldo was nodding. But... Yeah, I think that the answer is yes. Uh, that was discussed exactly. recently by Seo Kim in a, in a very mm -hmm. short but clean paper. So if you try to look at the at the saddles, the saddles are indeed uh, in the complex plane. There's one, one related comment, actually. And, and also, thanks for, for the talk, Louis. You know. So if you, so for instance, there is this paper by Seo Kim, and there is also a paper by Samir Murti which they study without taking large end limit. They simply study the Fourier coefficients of the series. So extract the Fourier coefficients at finite end and try to go as high as, as you can, okay? And, and do not take any complex P and Q. Simply take P and Q real and between zero and, and one. And there you see that you have exponential growth of states. No? So even at, at these real values of P and, and Q. No? Okay. So this is something that you should try to, I mean, it's not that the P and Q complex give the exponential growth. The exponential growth of the absolute value of the Fourier coefficients is, is always there. Okay. Yeah. I'm, so just, I just wanted to make this comment. So yeah, there are I, these two I, papers. On there. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks. I just, I don't know about this works. Samir Murti and Seo Kim and, and collaborators. Thank you. To work with you. Yeah, so I guess we entered actually the discussion. Uh, so, um, uh, Volodya, how to organize this discussion? I guess you are the organizer. Um, I guess we can still, people Maybe can I, still ask questions. I, I show a couple of slides. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah.